the decision was pretty obvious to us that in terms of what's happening now, we have to still be thoughtful about what's going on within our game because without the, again, utility or the usage argument, there's no point. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagner Ventures. On today's podcast, we have Mike Lopez, co-founder and CEO of Cinder. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagner Ventures podcast where we do company snapshots with interesting founders from across Web3. Check out wagnerventures.io to learn more about the syndicate behind the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Mike from Cinder. All right, I'm here with Mike Lopez, CEO and co-founder of Cinder. Mike, how's it going today? I'm fine, Tanner. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Really excited to chat. Um, so I want to talk about Cinder. Obviously, that's that's kind of the main event of what I want to talk about here. But I'd also love to hear a little bit of your story and kind of how you got to what you're working on now with Cinder. Yeah, that's a that's a great question and something I like to share with our with our audience and community. We, uh, my background actually is in tax. Believe it or not, I went to law school and, and did a lot of tax work for years, and then had an opportunity back in 2010 to join up as the CFO uh, and president of a game studio based in Salt Lake City, and that studio was called WildWorks. It was uh, very children's focused. Um, social, large virtual worlds. The principal project there was called Animal Jam um, and uh, did very, very well, actually. That game, a uh, lifetime, over 150 million registered users and localized in six, seven languages. It was a big, big game. And it was a lot of fun getting my feet wet into the games industry, um, working with gaming studios and kind of understanding the culture there and the ethos and what drives game design and game production. And equally importantly, also the importance of community around game, right? And um, how a community can not only affect the design and development, but also the culture of what a game can become, you know, and, and morph into. So that was a really cool experience. Um, and, uh, and actually the game Animal Jam is still running pretty strongly. A couple of years ago, or maybe about a year and a half ago, you know, we saw this big pivot towards blockchain gaming, even though there was stuff in blockchain gaming before a year and a half ago, at least in my opinion, it really, it wasn't on a larger scale until, you know, people started noticing games like Axie, for example, and Star Atlas. And um, I think game design studios started taking note, gamers started taking note, but there was a lot of skepticism, you know, around how is blockchain really going to be accretive to gamers? You know, is this just a, is this a gimmick? Is this a scam? You know, there was a lot of confusion and lack of clarity. And I think to be honest, we were sitting on the sidelines too, because we couldn't figure out, gosh, how can we tie in our community, which is more younger audience and, uh, you know, and, and web three blockchain, crypto tokenized avatars, that sort of thing. Couldn't figure it out really on all honesty. Um, and we saw what was going on with the apes, you know, and the, um, the real excitement around digital property rights. And as the year went on, this was last year, it became more and more evident that that was our answer. Um, it was digital property rights. Our, our players uh, spend lots of time in game customizing avatars and, and, you know, investing and expressing themselves through customization and creation, right? But at the end of it all, they don't own anything. The studio owns all of it. And you usually as a player are either, swiping your credit card over and over in-app purchases or paying a subscription just for the right to continue to access content that you've created. Well, we saw the light and said, Hey, you know what? Maybe we should pivot and work on something that will allow our players to express themselves, to establish a community, but then at the end of it to own what it is that they create. And then they decide what they do with it. They can keep it, trade it, sell it, do whatever they want with it. Right. And that really was the genesis of Cinder. It was one, let's skew up to an older audience. Obviously we love children, but you know, crypto is definitely more, you know, 18 and above by definition. Um, and then also let's not only, tokenize things but get on use social media channels and such to build communities things that you really can't do in kids gaming because of regulations like kappa um, and so that was around september of last year where we decided let's go for this in a very very big way so we set about to do a mint um, and we uh, we did so in february of this year we minted out 4444 pieces um, of uh, the initial genesis avatar and um, that's how Cinder was born. And um, it was a really, really fun ride. Uh, one of the cool bits about Cinder 
And now I'm kind of going a bit of a field because I've started off on how we got here, but now I'm just jumping in talking about Cinder. Is that okay yeah. if I do no, that? No, it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So along the way it's from September, October, November, December, um, the co-founder and I, his name's Clark Stacy. Um, we were traveling all over the country, going to a lot of different Web3 events you know, in Vegas, Austin, Miami, and just kind of really learning the lay of the land, met a lot of great people, a lot of projects that had some, you know, very, very aspirational and interesting goals. One of the things on the gaming side of projects that we noticed very, very quickly was that you had a lot of people that had great ideas um, and still have great ideas, but what they did not have was a track record of operating games. Um, And I thought that was interesting. I kind of filed that away off to the side and then went back to my own business of trying to figure out how can we mint out and, and, you know, launch avatars that or launch NFTs that look cool. We decided at that point that one of the differentiating factors for Cinder was going to be that at day one, the avatars were going to have an actual functional utility, not just a roadmap over the course of the next two, three years post mint, but actual, what can I do with this thing when I buy it? Right. And that was one of the founding ethos uh, factors of Cinder as a community was when we sell this and when somebody buys it, they need to be able to do something with it. They need to access a world or play a game. Um, we went ahead and on day one of our launch in February, we did just that. And I think that was one of the really unique things about Cinder you went ahead and you purchased your avatar, your NFT, and you went straight over to cinder.io and we already had a world built out. We already have a world built out. As a matter of fact, there's, we have over 12 different environments already built, but we're seeding them, you know, launching them uh, little by little as our community grows. But that was really, really an exciting piece was that there was an actual real utility. The players were able to go in, register within about five minutes. They were into the world. We were having AMAs in the world. We were having contests. We were having, um, you know, like, for example, art contests where your art could be displayed within the world, gatherings, parties, et cetera, and, um, and also seeding and showing our players how we were going to build towards a game mechanic as well later this year. So for Cinder, I think fast forward to now, what Cinder is, is uh, it's a community that's based on a couple of things. It's based on people that want to be creative, that want to customize things, that want to build things and collect things. It's based on a community that wants to play games together um, and to explore new worlds and to have a really, really fun and engaging time that way. It's also based on this new kind of Web3 ethos of, you know, gosh, I want to own something and I want that thing to have value and the potential to increase in value over time. What we're finding, though, in our focus isn't just on let's create NFTs that are going to you know be moonshots. People are going to be millionaires flipping NFTs. That's not what we're trying to do. We hope that over time, because of the utility within Cinder, that the NFTs will not only retain value, but continue to increase in value. But we found in our decision is that without a tie-in to actual gameplay, to actual utility, over time, these NFTs really won't be worth much at all because there's nothing to do in the world. And so for us, that's the whole impetus behind our roadmap. It's um, why we put together the team that we have, and it's why we're doing the things that we're doing. And I think people are taking notice. Um, it's been made public, but a couple of months, I think it was in May, where we were able to announce an investment from Animoca, for example. Um, yeah. met with Robbie Young many times. He's, a, he's the CEO of Animoca and really, really great guy. Very, very active in everything Web3. I mean, Animoca is not just games. They're wallets, Layer 2 solutions, everything. They do everything. And they saw what we were doing. We were very excited by it, by the team, by the vision, by the day one utility, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, you know, they're just one of many that have wanted to work with us, that are working with us, and that believe in the vision of what we're doing. So this year has been really busy, but also very, very exciting because we're able to articulate and show people go into the game right now and kind of see what the art style is, see what the vibe is. You can go and start exploring right now rather than waiting. And it's been a nice message to convey, not just to potential investors, but to community members that want to see something of substance. We've got a lot of ground to cover still. I'm not trying to say that we're a complete product by any means. We're not. We're still in the early phases. But that early phase, I think we have a nice head start um, of compared to other projects by virtue of the fact that we actually exist. Uh, and you can get into the world and check it out. So exciting stuff. But l- let me take a pause there and see if I'm even still answering the question that you asked. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's all amazing. I mean, there's so much in there we could we could talk about, and I do want to I, I do want to loop back on a couple of those items. But um, 
maybe one thing we could we could talk about right now is uh, you, you kind of mentioned that you know uh, uh, like for instance when I when I think about some of the projects over the last year and a half or so in kind of blockchain gaming, it does seem like there were a lot of interesting NFTs minted, and then the challenge is kind of the community and game studio building, right? Like the actual like building of the thing itself. Um, it seems it seems more difficult than maybe some some of the folks that didn't have the background uh, that you came into you came into this with, for example. Uh, maybe it just wasn't it, it, they weren't aware initially, and so I think I'm I wanted to lean into that a little bit. Uh, just some of the challenges associated with building a game studio and a community and doing this together with the community. Like, what is what does that look like? What are some of the unique challenges there, and how have you guys solved for yeah. that? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a very, very important point. And again, I want to preface this by saying that my intent here is to not be critical of other projects. And I, I know you're not oh, sure. that either. Yeah, of These course. are just observations. But what I did notice was that you had a lot of people with great ideas and, um, and really cool art, for example. And so the, the teams would get together, these young entrepreneurs, and they would have a vision, but they were so focused on minting out um, that I think the game design itself was secondary. And now having gone through a mint ourselves, I can appreciate how it is a very consuming process to promote it in your discord, to grow your community to make sure that you have a successful mint day, that it's not stalled, et cetera, et cetera. That's a full-time endeavor, right? But what happened was these projects would mint out, um, most of them on Ethereum, they, they were making you know millions of dollars on their midday and whatnot, and, and kudos, that's amazing to do. And I think they wake up the next day and realize, okay, d- does anyone here know how to build a game? And <laughs> it's a totally different skill set than to promote NFTs and to, to do artwork and to tokenize that and to, and to mint out. What people were starting to figure out was, hey, Building a game, it requires you to understand monetization models and game compulsion loops and fun factor. And, and you know, it's it's a very, very tricky art that requires a lot of kind of failure, frankly, trial and error, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's where some of these projects wound up stalling this year. They were well-funded or funded pretty decently, but then they had to figure out, well, we have to hire engineers and we have to hire modelers and riggers and artists and, you know, scripters and everything else along the way from soup to nuts. This is actually a, an entire team that we have to build around just the game. And um, I think that was a rude awakening for a lot of projects. And so you started seeing these roadmaps be, get pushed out further and further from 22 to 23 to 2024. Um, one of the benefits that we bring, that Cinder brings, is everybody on Cinder was associated with, I mentioned this company, Wildworks, that, by the way, is just made public just this Monday, a few days ago, um, uh, Wildworks was purchased by uh, an Indian, a public gaming company in India called Nazara. Great, great partners, cool. really, really big believers in not just Web2 gaming, but also in Web3 gaming and the future of blockchain gaming there. Uh, so Wildworks is going to be in great hands. But we had a, a chunk of people that really were excited about where blockchain gaming was going. So they came over to the Cinder side. I think collectively with everybody on the team, we have, if you added up all of our work experience, it's well over, you know, 150 years total of gaming experience. So we don't have any rookies on the team and that's at every position, the engineering side, the art side, design side, et cetera. And that makes a big difference right now. We're sprinting and releasing things now at a, at a pretty healthy clip, just small uh, improvements or small features in the game that I think are meaningful to our community. Um, but we're able to do that because we have an experience and a knowledge as to what it will take to get into sprint mode and, and, uh, to bug fix when you launch things, et cetera, et cetera. So for us, the experience piece was really, really critical. I think if I, you know, to be perfectly transparent, that was one of the things that made Animoca somewhat excited was, you know, these guys understand, how to operate a game studio. Yep. And so they ate them pretty quickly. Um, you had mentioned the community aspect. You're seeing a lot of talk around uh, DAOs, the concept of a DAO and how they might, how the community might shape what goes into a game or, or how treasury is handled, et cetera. That's going to be interesting in my opinion to see how that matures over time because it is important to take feedback from your community. And we are used to doing that. You do that sometimes in the form of, uh, surveys or polls or whatnot, you know, what avatar would you like to see next or what game feature would you like to see added? DAOs though in Web3 take that a little bit further where the players, they do have quite a bit of input and control. That becomes hard because, you know, when you're designing something, if you imagine compared to making a movie 
and Steven Spielberg is consulting fans about how should I, how should this scene, you know, develop? Sure, that yeah. becomes hard because he has a vision of how he wants it done. And right. every member of the community has a different thought on how that goes. So in, in perfect honesty, I, we have not figured out yet how to incorporate a traditional and full fledged DAO into the cinder world versus kind of our traditional web two way of doing it, which is going into our discord, talking to our community members and saying, Hey, what's, what's the top three new things you would like to see people vote on it. And then we take that into very strong consideration. So it's a delicate balance between the two. And it will be interesting to see how some projects manage that, that have already gone the way of Dow. But our intent is definitely, and has always been listen to your, your community members. What are the features they like? What don't they like? And do more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. It's kind of a trite formula, frankly, but it works. And it really is not limited to gaming. That's going to be in anything that you do. If you're listening to your community, you're going to have a much higher chance of success. Definitely. So you guys built on Solana. Is that right? So we minted on Solana. Yes, our first avatar. But that also was a was an educational experience, too. But let me let you finish your question. Yes. Yeah, so first avatar was on Solana. We used... Um, uh, Fractal. We launched on Fractal. Justin Kahn and his crew, great guys, great team. And it was a good experience. Yeah. I, I guess I'm just curious about the selection process of that and kind of what went into the, some of the thinking behind that, uh, that decision. <laughs> that you and everybody else we talked to. And that's a really, really fair question. Because remember, keep in mind, we were starting to think about this strategically last summer. And anyone that has been in Web3 knows what was going on last summer. There was mints. People were making $10, $15 million, $8 million on, on Ethereum mints, right? And we decided to go in a different direction with Solana, where I think at the time, Solana was at maybe 200 bucks, 200 soul or $200 a soul, right? So it wasn't anything near uh, the dollar conversion of what Ethereum was. And so people were kind of scratching their heads. There was two reasons why, two main reasons. One was, at least at the time, it felt like Solana was um, a little bit more environmentally friendly. Um, I think that as Ethereum 2.0 if and when that ever comes, it will come out. But I, I think that there are more and more answers to the energy consumption issue. And, you know, Solana, one transaction on Solana is less impactful than, you know, a credit card swipe or whatnot. So we went in that direction. But really, primarily, the main reason is that our intent is to be a game. And um, take like Star Atlas, for example, or, or even Axie. Uh, most web two games you know you can transact and swipe your credit card buy in-game currency buy uh weapons buy whatever you want and it's there there are no gas fees so to speak the price is what it is on ethereum the gas you know at least at the time even now it's one is unpredictable and it was really kind of cost prohibitive that for a real game once a, a real game kind of got up and running and you're having a ton of transactions within that game Nobody's going to want to, a real gamer is not going to want to keep paying that kind of gas. And I referenced Star Atlas because Star Atlas is a good example on Solana of a game where you can have a ton of transactions depending on what you're buying, every bullet that you buy or whatever it is that you buy, but you're not being gassed to death. So what we were looking at was, hey, further down the line, once this game and the gameplay mechanic is fully fleshed out, what makes more sense from a cost perspective as a, you know, assuming there's going to be a lot of multi-transactions, anything that reduces the cost of gas. And so that's why we went with Solana on the first mint. But I'll be honest, we left a lot of money on the table. You know, if we had minted on Ethereum and had minted out 4,444 pieces, that was in February. So this was pre-crypto crash and pre-really stock market crash too. Yep. We left a lot of money on the table, but we did it because it was the right decision for gamers. Um, however, an interesting development since then is that there are more and more solutions that are becoming uh, available to developers on the Ethereum side that then really mitigate the, the gas transactions. I mean, people understand or have heard of Immutable X, for example. There's other solutions that are similar to that that make things much more functional. And we have been giving a lot of serious thought to broadening our um, our community beyond just the Solana community, which is great, and welcoming the Ethereum community too into the world of Cinder. And we have plans to do just that, uh, hopefully later this year in our next with our next mint, which is a uh, the Minotaur avatar. I think that we are strongly considering doing that on Ethereum and bringing that community in because now it's a little bit more or a lot more 
cost friendly in terms of transaction. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. A hundred percent. Um, I want to touch on the, the roadmap piece because on your website, uh, there, there is a really interesting roadmap laid out. I think I'm curious, even wanting to connect it to some of the bigger trends you're seeing, like you already talked a little bit about, um, people are trying to figure out, you know, how to incorporate the community in the process of, of, of building these games and maybe DAOs, you know, that's, that's a hard one to say where it's going to land, but that's one thing people are thinking about. I think I'm curious about your roadmap as it relates to some of these bigger trends you're thinking about, uh, cause you have a really interesting vantage point on just kind of the whole space in general. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, a, <laughs> you're asking all the perfect questions here uh, in terms of what we were thinking, let's say five months ago versus what we've learned now. And, uh, a lot of it related to the, the crash, really. It's been really, really helpful for us in reformulating what our priorities are. With And I'll, I'll give you one very, very specific example. You go back to earlier this year and tokens tokens were the rage, right? Uh, you had VC that were aping into projects and not wanting equity. They wanted tokens, right? Because they saw that as a quick way to liquidity, whereas a traditional equity play would be three to five years before they could convert it. Tokens, they were liquid later in that year. And you were seeing a lot of coins being launched and doing very, very well. Subsequently, though, you were seeing those coins descend straight to zero and are now largely worthless. And I'm not naming any coin in particular. We have some that are still very sure. valuable, but yeah. a lot of them by and large went to zero. And the reason they went to zero, it, you know, in retrospect, it's not a, a big kind of scientific discovery. They went to zero because there was nothing to do with the coin other than just to hold the coin. And once the, the stock or the market started to crash, People didn't feel the same euphoria of just holding coins as they did when the market was increasing. They didn't want to be as speculative. We were, I, you know, we were talking about, gosh, we got to get to a coin really quickly too. We've got to start staking, et cetera, et cetera. But we took a step back and it was right around the time that we were talking to Animoca. They introduced us to their um, tokenomics crew, which by the way, is an insanely talented group over there. We're, we're working with it. Yeah. Uh, people that have advanced degrees in mathematics to helping us design our economy. It's, it's really amazing. But yeah. the, 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 uh, the decision was pretty obvious to us that in terms of what's happening now, we have to still be thoughtful about what's going on within our game because without the, again, the utility or the usage argument, there's no point. So on our roadmap, for example, we want to introduce staking and that is coming online now here pretty soon, but we were going to do it months ago. Thank goodness that we did not because the game mechanic still has to be fleshed out where we can communicate it in a way that makes sense to our, to our players. And without something to do in the game, what is the point of staking your avatar to accumulate pre-currency and then convert that to an actual token launch right. with nothing to do, right? right? And so we're thinking about things the way that a game studio would be thinking rather than speculators. And another trend that we're seeing that I think ties into this, and it goes to your question, is the whole concept of play to earn, right? P2E was the buzzword and still is to a large degree. People like to talk about play to earn this, play to earn that. And okay, I get that. And I, I don't want to get into a semantics debate over whether that makes sense or not. But our thinking has shifted to instead of even implying that you're going to get rich owning one of our avatars, that's not what we're trying to do. You know, if you want to speculate and become rich by owning a, a, an avatar, buy stock or, you know, we're a game studio. We're making a game that's fun. And hopefully what we want to do is make people come in and be part of the community because they want to play games and they want to be part of a community. Now, along the way, They'll go ahead and they'll have the opportunity to add value to the things that they own. Yes, but we're not primarily looking at ourselves as an investment vehicle. We're not a good way for a guild to come aboard and, you know, make money and pay their rent by grinding in our in our environment all day long <laughs> right. a full time job. That's not what we do. Um, what we want to do is is be one of the first really true games in Web three that is populated largely by gamers. And that I think is a very aspirational goal because the reality is gamers have not by and large aped into web three yet. They're not big believers yet in, in critical mass in particular, because you see a lot of people focusing more on how can I make money versus is this fun? And so in terms of the big trends, those are two examples of things that we were seeing a lot of that it was tempting to get caught up in, but we decided to 
make the decision that made more sense from a game perspective. Um, and I think it was the right one in retrospect. But again, we did leave some money on the table. We're comfortable with that, though, because what we didn't do is make a big mistake that we would have to then unwind. And so yep. as we're sitting here now, our goal is for the rest of the year is now we can really focus on communicating what the game loop is going to be like. And then, then we can introduce staking because then people will want to participate in that because they think the game's going to be fun. Yep, totally. So zooming out a little bit, uh, I'm curious about any advice you might have for other folks building in Web3, whether it's gaming or just uh, the broader space, right? And I know that's, it's a huge space. So uh, if you want to focus on gaming, that's, that's cool too. But um, like one, one takeaway for me from this conversation is, you know, you kind of get a sense for the values of a company or its founders uh, by the decisions they make. And it's clear that, you, you know, putting, putting the gamers experience first has been kind of from the start a priority uh, for Cinder. And so I'm curious, I mean, that's a takeaway for me from this conversation, but I'm curious what else you might want to share for folks that are thinking about things or maybe they haven't even started yet and they're just kind of on the sidelines, like you said, originally, uh, any advice for those folks? Yeah. A few things come to mind and I'll, I'll have to, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and lay down a, a preemptive warning that I am not Gary V. I don't, I don't intend to be a motivational speaker here, <laughs> sure. but, but yes, having kind of wet my, getting wet behind the ears here and rolled up my sleeves for the last year and a half in this space, a few things come to mind. One, web three is, it's just a very, very exciting space. And as I'm sure you've noticed, what's true today might be ancient history in three weeks, right? Because everything is just changing so rapidly. And that's exciting to be a part of. I hear time and again, people will come to me and be like, man, I wish we had done X, Y, Z last year, but it's just too late now, right? And I'm thinking too late, not not on your life. This is the very, very beginning of what Web3 can become. Everybody that's in the space right now is truly like a pioneer. A friend of mine um, compared it, I think, very wisely to where we are in Web3 would be if your friend comes up to you, your friend's name is Henry Ford, and he's saying, hey, you know what, Tanner, I've got, I'm working on this thing. It's called the car, and it's going to have four wheels, and it's going to have a motor, and no horses involved. And we're scratching our heads thinking, what is the point of that, right? We already have horses. That's good right, enough, right? Right, right, right? That's where we are in Web3 right now is the car hasn't even been invented yet. And everybody that's involved right now is going to have a direct impact on what Web3 not only will be now, but generations into the future. I think there's a, a big chance to be disruptive. So my first bit of advice is it, forget the thinking that it's too late. This is the very, very beginning. Uh, it's never too late to jump in and to roll up your sleeves. And that would bring me to the second bit of advice is I think that early on last year, there was a big land grab for cash, right? And that's, I think whenever you see a disruption, you start seeing a lot of me too's, a lot of imitators and people that want to yep. lay claim and be first in stake and make as much money as you, you know, let's be honest, it is about making money because we're running businesses here. Fine. But at the end of the day, the things, the true business principles still rise to the surface. You need to have an idea that makes sense. An idea is not enough, though, because you also have, a t have to have a team that executes and a community that's going to be interested in cares. If your primary focus on a project is how can we make as much money as possible, if that's your primary driver, you probably will not be as successful or you might just fail outright. You have to look at what is the need? How can we be disruptive? And who is the community? How are we going to define that? And we're seeing that. It's not just in games. We're seeing a lot of things happening in Web3. For example, the NFL. You know, they're tokenized for the first time now. Last season, you couldn't. This year, you can buy season tickets that are now in the form of NFTs. You can buy concert tickets now that are tied to NFTs and that are tied to real utility. You go back three years ago and said, you know, gosh, I want to buy my NFL, my Raider ticket in the form of an NFT. Most people wouldn't even know what you were talking about right? Yep. It's become now kind of common parlance because more and more companies are figuring out that if you tie utility and uh, you know, communicate that utility to your community, you have something there that you can not only sell, but that you can kind of build off of. And so to a young project that wants to get into it, put the money aspirations aside for a second, not entirely, and think about how you can be disruptive and fill a need that is there and there's a ton of them in Web3, um, and then define who your community is going to be. If you can do that from the beginning, then you're running in a direction 
without that, if you don't know who your community is and what the utility is that you're going to serve, you're just basically running in a circle and not going to get very, very far. So I, I, those are two things that kind of come to mind that um, I think would have been helpful had we known that a year ago at this time too. I think it, we would have made some decisions differently, frankly. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, so maybe one last question here, Mike, uh, what are you guys working on now and what's the best way for people to kind of follow along on the journey or get involved themselves? Yes, that's a good question too. So the getting involved, uh, it's all happening on our discord. Um, I think that's pretty common in web three as everybody lives on the disc, but in terms of what we're working on now, we had, um, we went ahead and we did the mint and what we want to do here over the last like, summer's winding down and as we're heading into Q4, we're going to go ahead and we're going to release kind of teasers and more detail on what the gaming loop is going to be. I've heard it, our game loop compared to Pokemon Go. And <laughs> I, <laughs> I I don't bristle at that because that's Pokemon Go is awesome. I mean, it's a great sure, game. Yeah. It's a global deal. Over Everyone has played it. Yeah. 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 And, um, and okay, I, I can live with that comparison. I do see some of the comparisons, but basically we have the lore in our game and Cinder is about, um, these kind of fantastical avatars that are, um, you know, like the Minotaur or the Fey that live in this environment. There's going to be mechs that kind of get loose that are kind of disruptors that are basically the uh, antagonists in the story. And you're going to have the opportunity to go ahead and hunt them down, uh, capture them, build them up, customize them, and then battle them. That's going to be the primary core of the game loop itself. On top of that, though, we're also building a social world. You know, that's one of the things that we do very, very well because without without the social aspect, it's, you know, some players don't want to battle. They want to hang out. They want to talk. They want to trade items, et cetera, et cetera. So our world's going to continue to grow. We have a lot of environments already built that we're going to seed and tease. Staking is coming online. We do have a token launch. We haven't set a date um, I think we're tentatively looking at early Q1 of next year for the token launch. And again, Animoca, uh, they're helping us design and, and run with that piece. So we're really excited about the potential to be very successful. Um, and so that's that's really a lot of what we're doing. We just released a couple of weeks ago something that we feel is pretty unique within the space. We call it our imp generator. But with, our, with every um, avatar that we launch that we mint, it's going to come with the, to, the ability to get a creator token that will be airdropped to your wallet where you can go in and use our tools to create a custom avatar and then tokenize that yourself. It's a true one of one that you have made, not one that we have made and that you've purchased, but one that you have made and then yeah. you can sell it or not. So we that went live just, gosh, a week and a half ago, maybe. And there are a few tools that are similar like that in, in a couple of other games, but the level of customization with our tool, I think is very, very unique. So if uh, any listeners out there want to kind of see what that is like, they can go and check that out, cinder.io or look for Cinder on YouTube or whatnot. There's a lot of different videos and walkthroughs that talk about that. So bits of tech that are really going to be the foundation and backbone of what's going to be a complete gaming experience. That's going to continue to come out every few weeks. We have new things coming out on our project roadmap. And if really, if you're in the discord, you'll have the most up to date estimates of time and, and release dates, but it's all heads down about, developing the game loop, getting that out to our community. Um, you know, and then my job is as the CEO is to continue to evangelize Cinder at these events. I'm talking to a lot of people that are interested in following along with Animoca um, from a financial perspective and being involved from an investor standpoint into what we're doing, into the team, into our vision. Um, I think a lot of people are excited about that. So it's going to be a busy rest of the year, but really, really fun and exciting. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And when you have a fun story to tell, it's not work. It's really you know, it's more fun than anything else. And that's really what cinder has been. Totally. Mike, thank you so much for the time. This was an awesome conversation. I feel like I learned a lot and I, I think the listeners are going to love it. Um, everyone join the discord and, uh, follow along with what Cinder's building and Mike have a great rest of your week. Yeah. Thank you, Tanner. Thanks for having me. I appreciate your community and, uh, looking forward to seeing what you guys do too with your podcasts. Awesome. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.